Young New Yorkers have a lot on their mind this election cycle. This will be my first year voting in the presidential election. Herman Bernstein, or Bernie to his friends, is a retired manager from an airline company. Like many other retired New York seniors, he supplements his income as a poll worker. Blood centers like the New York Blood Center usually have an eight-day supply of blood, but are now hovering at a three- or four-day supply. New York has been known as a bike-friendly city for some years now, and a major reason for that was the implementation of City Bike in 2013. It's the largest bike-sharing network in the country, and it is only going to continue to grow. We went out when it's dark, which was like mysterious and exciting, to a movie, and as my father drove to this area from the highway, you could see in the distance the movie screen. The, it lit up like the whole sky and it was like, oh my God, look at that, look at that. I'm Rachel Green. I'm William Johnson. I'm Ariel Pacheco. I'm Buzz von Ornsteiner. And I'm Noelle Lilly. We'll have these stories coming up on 219 West. It's a hallmark of a democratic society, a government for the people, by the people. But not all people who are eligible to vote do so. There are some who feel disenfranchised or skeptical of the real effectiveness of voting, and that often divides down generational lines. For decades, turnout among young voters has been significantly lower than older Americans. But in recent elections, those numbers have begun to change. And with 2020 proving to be one of the most tumultuous election seasons ever, how will young people respond? Your vote is your chance to speak up for the city you want. Young New Yorkers have a lot on their mind this election cycle. This will be my first year voting in the presidential election. It is my first time for a presidential election. Many obstacles have discouraged young people from showing up at the polls in past elections. Um, do you have like five hours? <laughs> but according to the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, 2018 showed the highest number of youth voter turnout that we've seen in a midterm election since the early 70s. And this isn't something about Gen Z. It's not something about millennials. It's always been the case. The youth vote in the United States is categorized as 18 to 24 year olds. This group has often voted at 20 percent below the average turnout. And so it's something that's really a structural problem we've identified over the past 20 years. Let me just say that we have 11 million people in this country between the ages of 18 and 20. There are another 14 million between the ages of 21 and 24. That's a block of 25 million people. If those young people will register and vote, they can literally change the direction of the United States. And they, they have a moral obligation, they have a political obligation to register Since the 80s and 90s, campaigns like Rock the Vote and Get Out the Vote have tried to increase youth voter turnout because younger Americans make up a large portion of the voting eligible population. In New York, nonprofit groups like Generation Vote are working hard to energize and educate young voters. Maim Hawk is a student and college team leader for Gen Vote at Queens College. So one of the main things we do as a team at, as Generation Vote, especially on campus, is that we mobilize around young people's issues. And, and we also try to do a lot of initiatives or organizing around youth advocacy issues. Hawk says that he's noticed many of his peers don't have a deep understanding of voting as a whole. I do feel like the country in general does a very poor job in engaging young voters in providing good civic education. How many 18 and 19 year olds know where to go to register to vote? Um, how many young people are taught about voter registration in high school? According to our data that we collected this year, it's just over half. In 1972, the voting age was lowered from 21 to 18 through the passage of the 26th Amendment, partly because of the Vietnam War. 
Young people at the time felt that if 18-year-olds were considered old enough to be drafted to fight in a war, they were old enough to vote for who their leaders would be. Since then, Kisa says that contrary to popular belief, voter turnout among young people has actually fluctuated over the years, with both high and low numbers of young folks showing up on election day. There's this myth out there that youth voter turnout has been on a precipitous decline for decades, and that's just not true. If we see issues of access, we don't see issues of apathy. Kisa mentions Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders as political candidates who were successful at rallying young people together, boasting high numbers of youth voter turnout. According to the Pew Research Center, 66% of voters under the age of 30 voted for Obama in 2008, and 60% did so in 2012. Young people were invited to be leaders. Young people took leadership, right? Young people's voices were valued. And that's what we see happening in some of the more successful, you know, opportunities for young people to participate. Some young voters think that the two party system is part of why young people may be less likely to vote. There's like so many diverse political ideologies and so many people have so many different thoughts and perspectives. And when you just have really two main parties where those issues are just divided out to, then a lot of people wouldn't be interested in casting a vote in the first place because they feel like neither party is aligned. And those issues range far and wide among young voters. For me, defunding uh, police, more, uh, more funds into low economic areas and more money into mental health. For me as an LGBT person, that's a huge, huge part of it, um, securing trans rights and like student loans and just free college in general is something that I'm hugely passionate about. Kisa says that making information accessible to young people is more important in the 2020 election than ever before. Lots of people think this is an unbelievably significant election and we have to find new and innovative ways to get the information to people who wouldn't otherwise come across it. And young voters themselves say this is a duty they're more than ready to take on. I think that us continually just letting our voices be, be heard on things that matter to us, it won't, it won't go unheard because we're, we're next, you know, we're next, we're the next leaders, we're the next everything that's coming forward that's going to anchor uh, this country. Because to them, the voice and the vote of the youth are what matter most. It's easy to get discouraged. And I think, I don't blame people for feeling that. Um, this is our future at stake, and we're going to fight for it. Next week, New Yorkers go to the polls in what is sure to be a unique and controversial presidential election. The COVID-19 pandemic is still a threat, so many voters may have chosen to vote early or by mail to avoid Election Day crowds. On the front lines of our elections are poll workers, many of whom are retired seniors most vulnerable to the coronavirus. I got to speak to two senior poll workers about what their job is really like and what may have to change under these unprecedented circumstances. Herman Bernstein, or Bernie to his friends, is a retired manager from an airline company. Like many other retired New York seniors, he supplements his income as a poll worker. The first election I worked was in 2016, and it was just nonstop people from six in the morning until, until they closed, and there were still people in there when they closed. And um, they just keep coming. There are waves and waves and waves, everybody imaginable. But a COVID-19 spike has Bernie wondering whether he'll work the election this year. You can't trust that little virus. It's, it's, <laughs> it's nasty, you know. And, and you know, at, at my age, you know, I'm, I'm, you're really rolling the dice if you get it. For Teresa Hommel, a poll coordinator and trainer at the Board of Elections, early voting is the key to voting safely and comfortably. Four years ago, we didn't have early voting. So... Four years ago, everybody had to vote on election day. But now they're going to be seven, uh, nine days in advance when people can go to vote. And so they're basically 10 days. And so there should be one tenth of the number of people going to vote each of those days. And I would definitely encourage everyone to vote early. Um, I voted early last year. I went to the early voting poll site. It's not the same as the regular poll site, 
And um, I was very impressed. The organization was excellent. Everybody was doing a really good job, and it wasn't crowded. Bernie is also a fan of early voting. I've worked the last two early voting periods, and and that's almost like a sane environment, you know, and the pay is good, and it sort of evens out for the ordeal of election day. As for mail-in voting, Bernie is skeptical, while Teresa is mostly confident. In, this, in other states, like Oregon, Washington State, I'm sure there's five or six, Ohio, I think, they administer it, they've done it, they administer it, there's very little to complain about. Um, New York State, I wouldn't trust, I wouldn't trust the apparatus. Uh, I wouldn't trust this, the Board of Elections, I wouldn't trust any of those people. Uh, if my local post office is any um, representative, the people working in my post office are very diligent and I wouldn't expect any problems from my post office. Whatever the method though, Teresa and Bernie are in complete agreement on the importance of voting. I love to vote, right? I think it's a, a citizen's duty and a citizen's privilege to choose your own government. It's a privilege and, and a right, and so I gotta go to Madison Square Garden to vote, so like, big deal. There has always been a need for blood donations. Medical experts say every two seconds, someone in the United States needs blood. But since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, new problems have occurred that are making it harder for people to donate. It's also more difficult for blood centers to keep up with hospital demands for units of blood. Traditional blood drive locations are on lockdown, which means nowhere to give and many citizens are worried about the safety and cleanliness of donation spaces. At the New York Blood Center, I got some answers about how you can give blood safely and help save lives even during a pandemic. Blood donations are needed on a daily basis for thousands of patients who require transfusions. Whether it's a patient with cancer, a chronic illness, injuries, or having surgery. Blood centers like the New York Blood Center usually have an eight-day supply of blood, but are now hovering at a three- or four-day supply. 4.5 million Americans receive blood transfusions each year, and up to 40,000 pints are transfused every day, and the supply has historically been low. And in the time of a pandemic, blood centers are desperate for donations. Many donors traditionally have gone to blood drives held at schools and offices to give blood. Now that many of those sites have been closed down, places like New York Blood Center have been faced with even more hurdles while collecting blood for hospitals and patients in need. Although there are all these medical and technological advances, we still can't make blood. So the only way for us to get blood to patients is by people coming out and donating. Up to 75% of the incoming blood supply is now threatened because locations where many citizens used to go to give blood have been shuttered due to COVID-19. School authorities and business owners are reluctant to open their doors to students and customers, let alone hold blood drives inside. So blood centers have taken added precautions to make the experience as safe and easy as they can. The first thing, you have to have face covering, we will take your temperature, and then you come in and fill out your uh, registration process, which is an online process. You have to show and bring identification. And then after you complete your online registration, you sit with the donor specialist where they will take your temperature, again, your blood pressure, and go over medical criteria questions. After that, your uh, walk to the donor bed area and the act of giving blood is, you know, five to 11 minutes, but certainly no more than 15 minutes. And then after that, you are escorted to where we are right now, which is our refreshment area, where the best part is that you get to enjoy juice and cookies. New procedures for staff and social distancing have also been put in place. We have additional cleaning protocols that we have implemented throughout the donation process, from registration to doing your 
medical history and the canteen or refreshment area, which is where we are right now, where it's all single serving and we have uh, dividers to keep donors socially distanced. And there is an urgent need for a wide range of donors from all demographic groups. So you come in, please. This is for all the minority community. Please to come in and support and help us, whether it's towards COVID or to um, helping people that have sickle cell anemia and in the minority communities, and that will help us a lot. We are really urging um, people of all races and ethnicities to donate blood or platelets in order to increase the diversity of the blood supply. This is especially critical for patients who have um, rare blood types or patients who need constant transfusions because for those patients, blood products are matched more closely. So who can give blood? You can donate if you're 17 to 75 years old, you weigh at least 110 pounds, you're in good health with no COVID-19 symptoms, and you have some form of identification. We don't just want to wait until when it's COVID or if it's a fire for anyone to come and donate because we need the blood 365 days a year. It's really like taking 15, 20 minutes out of your day to actually help save someone. There's not many things you can do that, you know, will help you do that. You can be someone's hero. City Bike, New York's bike sharing network contains 15,000 bikes across the city. The newest expansion plan will see that number skyrocket to 40,000 bikes by 2023. Every borough except Staten Island will see new neighborhoods join the network. City bike has become a successful alternative form of transportation for many. This past September saw the highest ridership city bike has seen since its implementation. And with many commuters staying away from public transportation since the coronavirus pandemic, the expansion is something many New Yorkers want to see happen as soon as possible. New York has been known as a bike-friendly city for some years now. And a major reason for that was the implementation of City Bike in 2013. It's the largest bike sharing network in the country, and it is only going to continue to grow. I spoke with John Orcutt, who works for Bike New York as an advocacy director and has a long history with working on biking issues, including working at the City Department of Transportation when City Bike began. Well, I mean, City Bike, is, City bike started with um, about 7,000 bikes in 2013. The fleet on the street right now is about 15,000, so it's doubled in that time. Um, and it's in the midst of a plan which was announced actually about a year ago um, by the mayor in the Bronx to go to about 40,000 bikes, so it's a pretty big expansion. People are continuing to ride city bikes even through the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic hasn't slowed the expansion plan at all, and city bike ridership is actually at the highest it has ever been. Um, I actually think it's kind of a good news story that this has continued through the COVID pandemic without too much of an interruption, um, which is good because you know, we're seeing incredibly high bike usage now as people are avoiding public transit and people enjoy it at least for a time, somewhat less traffic, uh, car traffic on the streets. When City Bike first arrived in 2013, there was contention over the parking spaces it would take up and how some neighborhoods did not want it in the area. Since then, that has changed. While there will always be some form of contention, for the most part, people want to see city bikes in their neighborhoods. Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, the, the argument you tend to get in the city now isn't so much like, this thing is a pain in my neighborhood, I don't want it. It's, why aren't we getting it faster in my neighborhood? Um, you know, I mean, look, it's always, there's two sides to every story anywhere you go in the city, but. Um, but the demand for city bike is high and people want to see it. One key issue the expansion does bring about is the city's infrastructure. There are a limited number of bike paths and lanes, which can make biking dangerous. City bike expansion could be moving faster than the city is ready for. I mean, one of the issues that the expansion does create is, um, is the city moving fast enough with bike lanes, especially protected bike lanes and high quality bike lanes that cars don't park in, which is a a big design problem the city has generally. Bike safety has always been a major topic of discussion among the cycling community. 
They are constantly advocating for more safety precautions, especially recently. While bike deaths have increased in the past few years, city bike has not been a reason for that. It actually hasn't increased. It. I mean, we know from, for a fact that we've had um, two city bike fatalities since 2013. Um, so this average city bike riders tend to be um, in fewer serious crashes and way fewer f fatal crashes. The expansion plan will bring city bikes to uptown Manhattan, the Bronx, and parts of Brooklyn and Queens. It is expected to be completed in 2023. The drive-in movie surged in popularity from the 1950s to the mid-1960s, hitting a peak of nearly 5,000 theaters across the U.S. The decline in popularity of the drive-in happened gradually over time, as families and couples discovered other pastimes. Today, fewer than 400 remain. Now, drive-ins are getting a second run, as COVID restrictions keep most indoor movie theaters closed. But there's another reason, those seeking a nostalgic look into our past. So, while other forms of entertainment remain shut down, the drive-in once again is being experienced. And I think the experience mostly was how exciting it was to go out when it's dark. I mean, we didn't stay up late. So that was like, we went out when it's dark, which was like mysterious and exciting to a movie. And as my father drove to this area from the highway, you could see in the distance, the movie screen. The, it lit up like the whole sky and it was like, oh my God, look at that, look at that. For Pam Hartwood, memories of the drive-ins have remained with her for a lifetime. Even going to the bathroom was an adventure. Going back was like even more fun than the movies because I would pass all these cars and just look into the people having fun and laughing and, you know, things that maybe I shouldn't have seen, but I just kept walking. And that was like an eye-opener to me. The 1950s and the 1960s were peak years for the drive-ins. At one time, there were about 4,000 theaters across the U.S. I think there was something unique about it, something like it made it a special experience. And I guess it was romantic because you could be close to the person you were with and there was nobody else next to you. It was almost like a taste of freedom and independence. It was like a secret place um, doing things that I could never do in my real life. So it was, I was a movie in a way. <laughs> and um, I just remember drinking a lot and um, you know, doing a few things that I won't tell even you because I'm gonna take that to my grave, I decided. But I think we all can relate to it. Today, fewer than 325 drive-ins remain in the U.S. Dwight Grimm owns the Greenville Drive-In in Greenville, New York, and writes for the blog, Cinema with a Twist. You know, there obviously were technological changes, television viewing, um, you know, everybody likes to point to, oh, the VCR killed, you know, the drive-in and movie theaters and whatnot. There's some truth to that, but um, to be honest, there was other sociological things, shifts that were happening. I grew up in the 80s. Everybody in the 80s, you hung out at the mall, right? So you didn't go to the drive-in anymore. You went to the mall and the movie, the hardtop movie theaters, the multiplexes there were part of that kind of experience. The owner of the Fair Oaks Twin Drive-In in, in Middletown, New York, says it's all about dollars and cents. The reason why a lot of the drive-ins disappeared out of New York was um, real estate. Real estate was too valuable. Uh, that's why you still see some of them up in upstate New York, a lot of them in the south. But never fear, drive-ins are making a comeback. They were coming back sort of pre-COVID, I believe. Um, yeah, obviously, COVID has sort of accelerated, I think, the interest in drive-ins. Um, part of it has to do with, um, you know, we're moving to a more experiential culture. Um, and so, you know, there is a nostalgia element to it. There's also like, 
you know, for lack of a better word, there's an Instagram element to it. It's like people want to be able to take their selfie, you know, at some cool location. And, you know, it's obviously a lot more uh, visually interesting and tells more of a visual story to <laughs> take a picture of yourself at a drive-in. With many indoor movie theaters closed, even pop-up drive-ins are well popping up around New York City. However, it's the real vintage drive-ins, 28 of them fully functioning all over New York State that continue to be jam-packed. The reasons are... For younger couples that come in, they don't have to pay the babysitter. The baby can fall asleep in the back, and that's a big expense for a young couple to have a babysitter. So they just bring the baby in, and it's a nice night out for them. To get out of the house and do something is a nice night. And of course, drive-ins are a part of our American culture and social experience. All of my friends could pull in with their different cars and you get out and you socialize and you get back in the car and you make out when, when you wanted to. It was, it was very, very exciting, very romantic. But some remember the food as much as the fooling around. They have everything. My favorite, popcorn. And of course they had the other things. They, so they had you know, all the sodas, uh, the knee high, and the root beers, and uh, the Coca-Cola. So are drive-ins here to stay? I think we're, people are gonna be a little scared to go inside for a little while. I think we'll all get back to normal. But I think during this time, yes, the drive-in is making a comeback. And I think that a lot of people are realizing it's a different way. I think everybody should experience one time. It's something that's very magical to see these big, I mean, we have kids call them the big TVs out in the, out there. Um, and to see that in the nice fresh air, looking up and seeing the stars, and it's a very relaxing evening. Just an example of the truism, everything old is new again, or there's nothing new under the sun but what you forgot. <laughs> That's it for this edition of 219 West. We'll see you next time.